This is Trek Wire Week in Review for the week ending September 15th, 2023. I'm Haley Keen with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Hendry, Head of CRE and Advisory Services. This week, the acceleration of inflation did not shake investors, but it has left the Fed on alert for another interest rate hike. The markets watched as new PPI and retail sales data came in, and across the pond, we saw the European Central Bank raise its key interest rate to a record high. Manis, can you make sense of the latest news and data for us? Well, I think the big takeaway for the week is that even though most of the data points we saw this week were hotter than expected, that the bond markets and equity markets, investors across each, did not really get rattled at all. What we saw with the 10-year over the last week is the 10-year yield moved up two basis points. I think the two-year yield is up four or five basis points week over week. And that comes even as CPI was considerably higher in August than in July. The number was modestly higher than expectations. PPI was also above estimates, albeit not terribly so. And retail sales came in considerably higher than expectations. When you throw in on top of that, some negative headlines on insurance costs and other basically inflationary uh, things going around the country and higher gas prices, it's a little surprising how benign the reaction was in investors. People were not rattled. Uh, equities held firm. Interest rates didn't really shoot up. It probably puts more pressure on the Fed to raise interest rates next week, but by and large, it would stay the course for investors. Yeah, I think it'll be really interesting, Manus, to see what the Fed does, because this is what they don't want to see, uh, having CPI come in, even though it was just modestly above expectations, you don't want to see that reversal. They had several months where they were showing a decline, still above their 2% target, but it was falling in line with what everyone wanted to see. Now we've had a slight reversal. It comes in higher than what's expected. And then you have this kind of like pesky gasoline situation where gas prices are inching back up. And you have maybe it's Bloomberg that released a report about OPEC that says we're going to be having a huge deficit, which is just going to increase prices more. And all of this, you know, coming on the heels of PPI also being up, some of these other metrics that we're looking at. Unemployment, well, I did go from 3.2% to 3.8%. Um, on the last reading, which was a, a positive sign from the Fed's perspective. It'll be interesting to see how they interpret all these different data points. I had a couple of headlines here. Sales at gasoline stations rose 5.2% in August from July, which was the biggest monthly increase in the report that was put out by Barron's. If you look at food costs and other items up month to month, looks like Gas prices, regular gallon of gas was $384 in August compared to $360 in July. Still below the $4 threshold that we saw, you know, about a year ago, but um, pretty significant when you look at that, when everyone's feeling like, or we're hearing that we're in a decelerating inflationary environment. So it'll be interesting to see, we get another hot reading like this next report. I think the Fed's going to have to take some action, even if they don't do it this month. Yeah, I think the gasoline story, you know, the headline when you watch CNBC or Fox News, Fox Business or Bloomberg is that prices are going up. And there's no doubt about that. And that's a headwind for the economy. That's a headwind for inflation, certainly a headwind for commercial real estate landlords. It comes at a time where other costs are going up as well. It will certainly put pressure on NOIs and valuations accordingly. I think what's being missed to some degree in the national press is that Right now, I'm not sure that there's a card to play to push these gas prices lower. The Saudis have indicated that they're going to keep their production cuts in place for considerably longer. We know that the U.S. economy has stayed strong, and so demand remains pretty high. And we've already released a significant amount of oil from the strategic reserve, so that card can't be played. In addition... Just from a psychological standpoint, this never has an immediacy effect, but it, it does change psychology. The White House announced the cancellation of leases in Alaska, which changes the tenor of the conversation. It, it gives people the feeling like 
we will remain constrained in, in terms of oil and gas production for longer. And so when you put these all together, I think there's a very good chance that this month's CPI number, the August number that came out in September, will not be the last one that shows an uptick, right? We saw a big uptick in uh, August in CPI. It wasn't unexpected, but if we continue to see gas prices going up, it's hard to see those really feel-good headlines which say inflation is coming down when gas prices are surging. It just doesn't really work that way. I agree, and I think that's one that all consumers feel the pain of that one. I mean, it's not like you can significantly, if, if you're a commuter or you live in a place without mass transit, like I do in Texas, like there's no avoiding the gas station. And every time you go to the pump, it hurts, uh, regardless of how you stack up on the socioeconomic ladder. But if you're on the lower end of that, it, it's become, it becomes very burdensome. Uh, so I agree with you. I think it'll be interesting to see because I know at one point they suspended gas taxes. They've, you know, drained the the reserve, they try to pull all of these, uh, you know, tactics out to kind of keep that price from from coming back high. But it's just basic supply and demand at the end of the day, and uh, that demand has not waned, and the supply has. I know Haley, you mentioned on the read in the European Central Bank. I wanted to touch on that quickly. I don't have a lot of commentary on this, but. Uh, they raised interest rates by a quarter percentage point, so they're at a record high. They did signal that the Eurozone borrowing costs may have peaked, though. It did have some troubling effects for the Euro, sent it tumbling. They raised the bank's deposit rate to 4%, which was the 10th increase in a row. So again, you know, I don't think this is a U.S.-only challenge. It seems like this is something that's the inflation, interest rates, fuel and gas shortages, costs and going up, all those things are playing out in markets beyond the U.S. Yeah, I don't know what this means for the broader picture, and I, I rarely comment on political things, but somebody said this week that the correlation between President Biden's approval rating and gas prices is really extraordinarily tight. It goes back to my notion that there's no card to play any longer, that at a time where the president is looking to run for re-election. Certainly he wants his approval numbers to go higher. If we do see a, you know, a $4 handle on gasoline or God forbid a, a four fifty or a five again, you know, I, I think that's going to be a really bitter pill for the White House to swallow. And I'm not sure that there's any pivot that can be made to make that that pill any less bitter. But we'll see. I mean, this is just me spitballing on something I saw on uh, Barron's, I think, this week. It's funny, man. It's in the uh, in the valuation space, there's kind of this old joke of uh, the Coke can multiplier valuation method for hotels, where basically you take the number of rooms times 100,000 times the price of a Coke can and the on-site vending machines, and that gives you the value of the property. And so it's weird how sometimes some of these anecdotal things can actually have some correlation, like maybe what you just described. Well, the first time, I'll take a, a little pivot. The first time somebody started trying to explain big data to me, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and the value of it was when somebody came to me and said, in the past, there was always some guy at Walmart who was in charge of inventory, and he'd wake up every morning, look at the weather. He would say, okay, there's a big snowstorm coming across the Great Plains, and that means we got to up our... Uh, inventory of shovels and salt and, and and other things, windshield wiper fluid and so forth. And it was all, you know, seat of the pants. It was his experience and, and common sense that did this. And when Walmart finally pivoted to big data, the guy who was in charge of inventory ran it through the model and it said, yes, you need windshield wiper fluid and yes, you need shovels and yes, you need salt. But it also said, the other thing we sell out of winter storm after winter storm is pop tarts right <laughs> and he said you know we are like nobody in common sense would have said this like this is what we need to do but they when they said when they first ran through the model that was like the one takeaway that we gotta <laughs> we gotta stock up on pop tarts when people are locked in their homes they want that comfort food and and at that from that time on i was a big believer in the using data to uh come up with these oddball, you know, needs and applications. I really want to go on a riff about <laughs> why there's so much crust on the Pop-Tart. Why can't there be more fruit filling 
and less crust. But I'm not going to do that. This is a commercial real estate podcast, but I'm always pulling off the excess crust and just eating the middle. I would say the pop tart manufacturer man is probably has a big data model that says you can only put this much filling in and still sell it for this price, even with the excess crust, because people will just rip the crust off. <laughs> so let's jump right into our property type segment. And we have a lot to cover in office this week, a lot of trading alerts and some big headlines. It's a funny thing how we go some weeks without a lot, with not a lot of trading alerts and a lot of news. And then some weeks were inundated. And this week was the latter case, just inundated with news that affects the prices of bonds and the likely outcome of certain loans and what's going to happen to them. And we've been uh, trying to keep up with them as best we can. For those that are not on our, our mailing list, especially the ones that are the pay for commentary, we come out at 6.30 a.m. We do put out seven or eight stories every morning at 6.30 a.m. And then we do also hit the market with stories as they break during the course of the day. And these first couple will fall into that category. This one came out uh, earlier today. Uh, Senator Cassidy in Louisiana put out a press release uh, about one o'clock Eastern time today, which announced this. Shell is moving its operations in New Orleans to a new development. The new office will break ground in 2024 and will span almost 150K square feet. This report should make CMBS investors a little nervous. Shell is currently the top tenant at One Shell Square. That's on Poydras Street, 701 Poydras. The property is a 1.2 million square foot office and Shell's the top tenant with about 25% of the square footage. The lease there ends in 2026 and the property backs about $110 million of CMBS debt. So this is a story that CMBS investors will want to watch. For people that own real estate around that existing headquarters, that too may be something as that ecosystem changes. We've seen in Chicago, businesses flock from downtown into the river area. If that's what's happening in New Orleans, that could impact commercial real estate values in that one Shell Square neighborhood. And the Shell Square property itself does have a fair amount of uh, expiring leases over the next two years. So certainly something to watch there. Uh, this next one really took off on Twitter last night. We put the story out, I guess, around 5.50 Eastern time in New York, about 10 minutes after the news broke. And I think within five minutes, we had 5,000 views. And by the end of the day today, we had about 50,000 views of this particular story. Giving credit where credit is due, uh, the Puget Sound Business Journal reported that Microsoft will not be renewing its lease at the Bravern Office Commons when that lease ends in 2025. Microsoft is the sole tenant at that property with 750K square feet. The lease runs through 2025. Uh, we had warned readers and listeners in 2022 that this was a possibility. Uh, we were hopeful that the fact that they had already, Microsoft had already vacated 600,000 square feet at the Advana Office Commons would make the Bravern office more critical to the firm, apparently not. So Microsoft now moving out. At this point, we're now talking about 3 million square feet that Microsoft has relinquished or will relinquish in that Seattle Bellevue MSA. So this particular property backs a, a big CMBS loan uh, that is held in a single asset CMBS securitization, as well as a 2020 conduit deal. Um, I'll throw one more story out there. The 1740 Broadway asset, which we've talked about endlessly on the podcast, that note, a $300 million note, is going to be marketed for sale. The property is in Midtown West. It once had L Brands at a, as a top tenant. L Brands vacated. L Brands had 70% of the space. The property is owned by Blackstone. Blackstone indicated that they would no longer support operating shortfalls. And this has been in CMBS purgatory for about 18 months. Now, what is happening here is the special servicer has made a determination that note sale is, in their mind, the most expeditious way and the most profitable way to sell this asset. 
The loan is 300 million. The property's worth about 200 million. They will now go out and market this note. They hope to be done selling this by the end of the year. This has big, big implications for a CMBS bond. The AAA bond for this particular asset gets marked around 60 cents on the dollar. It has a balance of about 160 million. If this note sells for north of 160 million, these borrowers or these lenders on this AAA note will be made whole. Whoever is adventurous enough to go out and buy this AAA bond at 60, there is a chance that they will be paid off at par should this note sale be successful and meet a sales price which is close to the most recent BOV. BOV. If it comes out at a really disappointing execution, let's say $100 million, then the bondholder would get about $100 million back. Even then, it probably justifies buying this bond at 60 cents on the dollar. This is some of the inside baseball that is going on right now with the special servicers, with the decision about what to do with notes, how to maximize value, and there will be opportunity for adventurous CMBS investors to come in and buy bonds with the hope that these sales get done at decently acceptable execution. Yeah, that's a lot to uh, to come in on, Manus, but I'll try to go in reverse order. I think the uh, 1740, what's interesting there, if you look at the value of the collateral, 2014 was at 605 million. Uh, I think trough did like 175 million. Last month, the appraisal was like 187.6 million. Significant value loss on the asset. And this was from a 2015 deal. So it's just amazing to see that type of value loss in the midtown market. But I think as we've talked about for the last several months, I mean, you kind of have the haves and the have nots in the uh, in the office space. And this is one that unfortunately falls into that have not category. But as you mentioned, still has for CMBS investors potential to have the ability to pay off at par um, if they can buy in at that 60 cent on the dollar range. On the Microsoft story, you know, just some simple math. You said there's about 3 million square foot of space that they've vacated. You know, I, th I don't think people, you know, we realize when we read these stories, like these are effectively like campus type office buildings. These are single tenant Microsoft buildings where they're occupying the entire space. So for this one building, 750,000 square feet, they just gave up 600,000 in the Advanta office commons. At 3 million square foot, if a typical office tenant that's not Microsoft comes in, and you say that average lease size is 100,000 square feet, you're talking about having to get 30 of those just to backfill the Microsoft space. That doesn't mean anything else in that market. I'm just amazed when I start running some of these numbers out, when you look at like these office markets actually getting back to a stabilized occupancy, um, I just don't see a scenario where it doesn't take years to get there. I mean, the number of Microsofts that need 3 million square foot of space in one centralized location are just very few and far between. And I have to assume that these offices are configured in such a way for a single tenant campus style user like Microsoft. So on that one there, I think just really tough for that market. And it just shows some of the risk of having super high single tenant use like tech type exposure when they decide to, to, to walk, there's not a whole lot of option on the table. And then lastly, the shell move, uh, you know, you mentioned that they were the top tenant at about 25% of the space. For the first half of 23, this property was only 81% occupied. So, you know, there's got to be some kind of multiplier effect in my mind from the lender's perspective. If a tenant is 25% of the space and they leave, it's not just a direct 25% hit on occupancy when you're doing your due diligence on this. I mean, the odds of you replacing them at current contract rents are significantly less. So 25% loss in vacancy probably equates to a 40% loss in economic occupancy um, and just makes for a really tough time for that building owner. And I know in this case, the loan matures in 25, but you're already looking out now, like I think this is going to be a hard pressed deal to get refinanced, even though we're probably a year and a half out from when they have to face that. So some not great news there, even though we've had some green shoots in the office sector over the last couple of weeks. I'm interested in your opinion on this. I was part of a panel this week with that MBA hosted. Deborah Morgan was the facilitator. It was all about surveillance and surveilling your portfolio and and seeing what's coming down the road. One of the things that came up during the session 
and this is really where my question is going, is a feeling that note sales, whether they were from banks or from CMBS, are really going to accelerate over the next six months. They're already starting. We're seeing some, but the feeling is that that's going to be the outlet this time. In the past, during crises, we've seen extend and pretend as the real outcome. Here, there seems to be a lot of spirited debate that, no, 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 this time people are going to cut their losses, sell their notes, and move on. That's that's the way to maximize future value. Do you see it that way, Lonnie? Do you see it that being a different outcome with this set of conditions than compared to 15 years ago? I think we're probably starting to hear that on the street more than we did the last three or four months. Like I think at the onset of the interest rate hikes and everyone like rushing to see where the distress is and all this dry powder, everyone assumed that you would just automatically see properties going back and you know people being able to buy deals at a huge discount just direct from the lender. We haven't seen that happen. In fact, like maybe not surprisingly, but I think over the last six months, we've probably done 20 or so stories in the office sector where they've done some sort of a extension or modification, or they've done some cash in refactoring of the note so that the borrower can stay in. They hope that rates come down and they can permanently refinance. I'm not like convinced that we're not going to see more of that because we've already seen a significant amount of that now. And I think as the Fed kind of continues their hardline stance, like if lenders, if buyers, if they really believe that the Fed's going to hold rates higher for longer, I think the note sale option becomes much more palatable for people. And I think we will see a shift in, in people doing that. I think if people think there's some window of hope that they're going to maybe lower rates and some of these operators are going to come out okay on the back end, then you're going to probably see a little bit more of the extend and pretend. So I think it really hinges on people's general belief and how much longer the Fed's going to hold rates or if they continue to raise, what the appetite for that two or three year extend and pretend, if it stays or if it wanes. The note sale is an interesting avenue. I mean, I, I've definitely seen a lot of a lot of stuff online about it over the last couple of months that there's been probably an equal amount of those taking place as there has been the extend and pretend. Um, and in a lot of instances, I do think that probably makes the most sense and uh, and maybe give somebody the opportunity to, uh, to a path to ownership in a more streamlined fashion. You know, I'll underscore this point because now it's been brought up to me in private conversations several times by different players. This idea, and this is just a recommendation for people that are borrowers out there, this notion of going back to your bank and offering to buy your note back at a discount, kind of like asking for extra credit in a if you got a lousy grade in a in, in a in an exam, you're right. There's no harm in in asking, right? And if you're in a situation where you know banks are looking to reduce office exposure, office debt, right? If they're looking to raise cash and so forth, there's no harm in going back to your lender and saying, "Would you be willing to sell this note back to us?" Right? And the worst that can happen is they tell you no, and it, it's probably a wise phone call to make, you know, for some borrowers. I'll run through some other stories now very quickly. Some good, some not so good. Uh, no particular order. A big state farm loan has been sent to special servicing. This particular note is $383 million, backed by all state farm offices around the U.S. There were no special service or comments accompanying the transfer, but this is an asset we've been watching for a really long time. The collateral is made up of 14 state farm offices around the U.S. All the leases run until 2028, but the loan has an anticipated repayment date of April of 2024. Now, the problem here is the reason that this has become such a concern for us is state farm has closed almost all of these offices. So even though they're on the hook for lease payments until 2029, and even though There'll be a cash trap in 2024, which will hyper am the loan to some degree. This is probably a loan that is unrefinanceable. We know, to Lonnie's point before, these types of offices or campuses, they're built to serve one tenant. That tenant here is an insurance company. They're expensive to reposition. And really, nobody is going to lend on this thing in 2024 until there's clear 
uh, understanding of who's coming in to replace State Farm down the road. So uh, this was a negative story that we broke via a trading alert a couple of days ago. Um, another negative one, not happy to report this, uh, Cranes New York reported that Citadel was tapping the brakes on talks to take 400,000 square feet at 280 Park Avenue near Grand Central Station in Manhattan. Four or five months ago, uh, I think it was the New York Post reported that Citadel was looking to take 400,000 square feet, which would have been a real balm for the New York City Midtown Manhattan office market. Uh, those talks have now been paused, although we're told that they are not completely dead. Uh, in Chicago, the Aon Center loan, this is a $530 million uh, CMBS loan, has been formally extended. Uh, we said a few podcasts ago that this was likely, um, in this particular case, the loan is backed by a 2.8 million square foot Chicago office. The value is lowered is now well below the balance of the loan by more than $100 million. Uh, the note is spread across four CMBS deals, and that loan has now been extended for three years to July 2026. In the downsizing area, uh, KPMG is downsizing in Philly. They are going from uh, about 140,000 square feet at 1601 Market Street, where they've been for an awfully long time, that lease ends next June. Uh, they'll be moving to 735 Market Street. This story comes from the Philly Business Journal. The good news for the CMBS market there is 1735 property backs a big SASB uh, CMBS loan, a $311 million loan. In Minneapolis, a sign of life in the suburbs there, uh, there's a big distributor. They're called Johnson Brothers Liquor Company which is downtown St. Paul. Uh, the firm is looking to move out of St. Paul proper into Egan. Uh, why did this catch our attention? Well, Egan and the surrounding suburbs in Minneapolis have seen just an epidemic of companies subleasing space from uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, to Optum, to Thomson Reuters. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Johnson Brothers is looking to take over the Blue Cross Blue Shield space in Minneapolis, uh, and that would be a positive development for the uh, Minneapolis suburbs. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this is a nationwide story, uh, Roku has upped its charge that it anticipates to take for terminating leases around the U.S. A couple of months ago, the firm said, they were expecting to take a 35 to $40 million charge to close offices around the U.S. Uh, that has been up to somewhere between $160 million to $200 million. Even by Lonnie's standards, that's real money. Roku currently has offices in San Jose, Austin, Boston, Chicago, Concord, Mass., and Lehigh, Utah. Uh, when you're talking about a 60, $160 million charge, you can't rule out the fact that Roku may put that Coleman Avenue space in San Jose up for sublease. They are the sole tenant at 1143 and 1155 Coleman Avenue. And that's something for CMBS investors to keep an eye on. Yeah, so a lot to catch up on there. On Roku, we had talked several months ago that there was a thought they might um, be taking a charge back at under $40 million. Now we're talking 160 to 200 million. So I think that's a net negative for them beyond what they had even anticipated. Um, and as you mentioned, that covers a lot of major metropolitan locations with some pretty sizable office square footages. The uh, The story in Philly was interesting on the KPMG. You talked about them uh, downsizing. Uh, just a note on that deal, through the first half of 23, the, that office property, 1735 Market Street, had a 225X debt service coverage at net cash flow and was 88% occupied. So relative to some of the other stories that we've covered today, even with them downsizing um, KPMG in that building, that building on a relative basis is actually performing uh, pretty strongly. Uh, great news out of Minneapolis. I mean, I don't, I can't remember the last time we had a green shoot in Minneapolis, even as a potential sign of life. Um, everything there has been negative for some time. And as you highlighted, Manus, large companies with large footprints, large square footages 
that's another one that I think is over 3 million square foot of sublease space available. So it's really great to see there might be something uh, positive. I kind of thought it was funny on the Citadel stuff, not funny for the CRE participants, but we had joked about them paying their interns 5,000 a week. So that might have uh, put a dent in their ability to execute the lease there in New York. Um, but it did say the story that uh, that this was on pause and it didn't necessarily mean that there wasn't going to be a deal done. So hopefully we come back in a couple of weeks and talk about the um, the two sides coming to, to terms on that. And then um, uh, lastly, on the state farm loan, uh, really interesting concept there. I mean, you're talking about almost $400 million worth of a portfolio. I mean, do you think at some point they start trying to break that up and maybe offloading some of those offices in a better location? I mean, if you look at the insurance industry generally, it's been hit really, really hard. I actually had a call right before the podcast where we were talking with folks that are in that that space. And if you just add up the number of catastrophic losses over the last four or five years, I mean, it's unprecedented. You have you know, this triple whammy of interest rates, inflation, and then, you know, hurricanes um, and wildfires that have all kind of happened at the same time. Um, and so the insurers themselves are in a really tough spot, not notwithstanding these high, you know, leases that they have, you know, locked in and everything else. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see State Farm or some of these others as they try to consolidate, maybe just trying to offload some of these better buildings and, and trying to get out of out of some of that obligation. I think the theme for this week's uh, pod should be how Manus brings the news in almost like a futuristic perspective. Like in every single one of these trading alerts, you know, the news was covered first two or three years before something actually took place in some cases or five or six months before it took place. So if you're not, you know, getting the news from us or you're not listening to the podcast, you're definitely missing out on things uh, that you're not getting anywhere else in this type of a timely fashion. Yeah, it's a great point you bring up, Lonnie, that if you're waiting for a loan to become delinquent or if you're waiting for occupancy to show up on an asset at 45% or you're waiting for DSER to be uh, 0.75x on an asset that had been 2.25x, you're really kind of missing the boat, right? The people that you're competing against on the money management side, the trading side, the issuer side, they have processes in place, you know, they read our newsletters and so forth. And, you know, they know about this stuff within minutes of the time that is broken. So we see this all the time, you know, th these things are baked, you know, the two years before they happen. So when we talk about Microsoft, that lease doesn't end until 2025, but we know it now in 2023 that this could be dead loan walking, right? We don't know. I mean, it's probably class A space. This, you know, Seattle only has a certain amount of um, real estate out there that's of that quality. Um, but for those that are not on that game, you know, you're taking career risk and not knowing this stuff if you're investing in um, properties. I should, I, I joke about this. This is kind of funny because um, this is a little bit of inside baseball. For every one story we write about, there's probably somewhere between nine and 19 others that we could cover every week. Now, there's an opportunity for us to either have a daily podcast which I'm not advocating for, or having a daily update every morning like we do for the CMBS market for CRE, that rather than wait until Thursday for us to break these stories to, you know, really get this out to our audience um, every single day, because I do think nobody wants to get picked off in this type of market. I think that sounds like a great idea, but first we should probably check on Haley. I think she just passed out when you said daily podcast. <laughs> yeah, so I, you just I would have not to fire me from that. my day job and make this my full time job. I'll do it. That would not uh, that would not advocate that. My wife would be uh, dead set against it. My dogs would hate it because I have to put them in there <laughs> in, in a place where they can't interrupt me when uh, when I'm doing the podcast. So I, I think it's a universal or unanimous no for uh, the daily pod. And Manus, you do this without headphones, so your whole house gets to listen to our commentary and your commentary. Uh, it must I, I be riveting. Out, I walk out of the room, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> just, it, "Well, it's, Haley it's, and it's, I look like we're much. flying helicopters over here with yeah. our headphones on. It's like yes. we're uh... one day we'll have video for all you listening. That's right. So let's move on to hotel. We have a few stories there that we thought were important this week. 
Yeah, one good one and one pretty good one and then one not so good. So I'll start with a really good one. Uh, this comes from Commercial Observer. They reported that uh, the Margaritaville Hollywood Beach Resort has been refinanced uh, via a $140 million loan from Wells Fargo. The property is a 349 key full service hotel room, a hotel property. It does currently back a $160 million CMBS loan that backs a 2019 a uh, single asset deal. The good news is it does show that capital is available. Uh, the existing loan matures in 2024, and it looks like that will be paid off. Uh, Pebble Brook Hotels pay $270 million for the property uh, in 2021. At the time, they assumed the existing 2019 loan. In the kind of the mixed green area, uh, this next story comes from The Real Deal, uh, Rich Bachman, who we seem to reference every week, it's co-written by Jay Young. Uh, Magna Hospitality Group is paying $160 million to buy three hotels that are all at the same address in Midtown Manhattan. The address we're talking about is 150 West 48th Street. There are 1,000 rooms in this property, so the sales price equates to about hundred and sixty k a room. That's the disappointing part of the story. These types of comps used to come in somewhere between 275 and 425 per key years ago. 160 per room is kind of a disappointing comp for that part of the market. It's an interesting building. It's 38 stories tall, and it has three separate Hilton flags under the same roof. There's a Hampton Inn, a Home Two Suites, and a Motto Hotel that are piled on top of one another on this 38 floor building that covers about a thousand rooms. Uh, the seller is Sam Chang's McSam Group. Uh, Mr. Chang has been an active seller of hotels uh, over the last, I don't know, six months to a year. He's He seems to be pairing his portfolio at a, a fairly healthy clip. And this last one is just a really rough story. Uh, this is in the Chicago suburbs. The Real Deal reports that two Chicago area hotels have sold for deep, deep discounts to previous sales prices. Uh, the first one, Phoenix Development disposed of a 300 key property for 21.5 million. That equates to just 71,000 per key. Uh, the property was acquired for 31 million in 2018. So the value has fallen more than 31% over the last five years. But that only tells a little bit of the story uh, when Phoenix bought the property in 2018, there was an expectation that they would pump $14 million, uh, into the asset when they were looking to reposition it. So that turns out to be more than a 50% loss when you talk about the amount of, of capital they put into this. The next one is no better. And the buyer of that one, by the way, was Blue Sky Hospitality. The news wasn't any better for the Chicago Marriott Suites Deerfield both properties are in Deerfield, Illinois, a Chicago suburb. There, a Goldman Sachs affiliate acquired the property in 2013 for $29.8 million. The asset was sold this week for just $6.6 .6 million. Um, it represents only $26,000 per key, and it's a 78% reduction in value over the last decade. Ouch. Yeah, that one is really tough. I mean, like you wonder if that's uh, going to continue life as a hotel, if there's some other alternative use for that building um, at 6.6 .6 million. 26,000 a key is pretty rough. We don't have any information around the operations. I would assume occupancy has been really struggling there. It's interesting as you were talking through the other, the Hyatt Regency deal, Manus, um, and you listed the sales price there in 2018 at just over 31 million. You know, I was thinking to myself, I bet they had a PIP in place that was going to execute after uh, purchase. And then you talked about how they were going to put $14 million into it. I think there's a lot of hotels that were bought 2018, 2019 that had that type of buy value add reposition. And with COVID, all of those plans went up in smoke. And so a lot of these hotels are going to trade at some discount to their pre-COVID price because... They didn't put any of that CapEx into the asset. And so what you end up with are hotels that maybe were already tired, but were trading at high you know, premiums due to, to increased rep par and, and higher occupancy pre-COVID that now 
are really tired and they're not able to command the type of rents or the you know daily rates that they should. So really interesting story there. I think Chicago, you know, it's not just the office sector that we've talked about. Now we're talking about some of the suburbs having some of these down trades. On the Hollywood Beach Resort that you talked about, the refi, what's interesting there is, you know, they just refinanced an $140 million loan from Wells Fargo, uh, but they paid $270 million for the property back in 2021. And so that was an interesting tidbit on that story. So, you know, some good news on the hotel front, some not so good news on the hotel front this week. All right. So we're running long, but we have multifamily comps and I know you can get through them very quickly, Manus. So let's run down on multifamily. Yes. My deep school closing uh, AM radio voice that our listener has uh, attributed to me. Uh, The first one's a real disappointing story. This is in Fremont, California. Uh, Artist Walk, which is a 185 unit complex in Fremont, uh, sold this week for $89.75 million. The property does have 30,000 square feet of retail. The sale equates to about $485,000 per unit, which is a nice price, you would think. Uh, why was this a disappointing note? Um, we found a story from the registry out in California that noted that this property last sold in 2019 to Clarion Partners for $110 million. So um, 19% drop in value over four years, sales price per unit, goes from 595k to 485k. The rest of these are just placeholders really for people that are in certain markets. In Coconut Creek, we saw the ad veneer at Coco Plum, a 360 unit property uh, get acquired by Ashford Capital. Story comes from the real deal. This amounts to a slight improvement in value. This property was valued at 65 million in 2017. Sales price was $70.4 million. Uh, in Placentia, California, 125-unit property sold for five hundred and five dollars per unit. This is Union Place at 1500, Cherry, 1500 Cherry Street. Uh, the buyer was Gilt Venture. Um, the property was valued at $46 million in 2016. Uh, sale price was $63 million, so about $505,000 per unit. Uh, in Tampa, Captiva Club sold for 126 k per unit. This is a 361-unit property at 4401 Cap- Club Captiva Drive. Uh, the buyer was Sinatra and & Company. And lastly, in Whittier, California, Citrus Court uh, at 8121 Broadway has sold for 226 k per unit. Uh, this is a 138-unit property that was constructed in 1967. Sales price equates to about 226 per unit. All right, let's turn to shout outs. So a loyal listener and friend, Stacy S, sent us a few suggestions on topics she wants us to cover. So we will get to them in the next few weeks. She wants us to talk about buy down fees on agency deals and the impact of this activity, and also insurance. We know it's been a hot topic, and we, she wants us to get into some of the details that we're seeing there. So stay tuned for some segments on that. Let me jump in and just say that there are so many people that email us every week. We don't always get back to responding. We really try hard to. There's been requests about special servicing, self-storage, nursing homes, and so forth. We will do our best to both reply to your email and pump in some data on these topics in the near future. Uh, At the moment, I think Haley's down to about four hours sleep a night, and uh, we don't want to push that down to three. So, uh, but we will, we will get back to you at some point. And thank you so much for the, for the inbound. Only Thursday nights, Manus. It's okay. Andy B said yes to the wing sauce. So Manus, you made a joke that I could make some trepwire buffalo wing sauce for football season. So we might have a buyer. I think we'll have to do that. And he also sent us some AI tools to test to turn some of our content into, you know, Trep AI bits. So we'll let you know if we test those out, Andy. Mark M took you up on your offer, Manus, to meet up in Las Vegas. So I hope you guys can make that work. Gary W, he's another one who had some suggestions for us. He wants some senior product coverage, assisted living, memory care. So more to come on that. 
And Blanford R. said he's enjoyed our recent podcast updates. He thinks we accurately identified the distress in Baltimore. However, he has not yet heard us address the development in the area of Baltimore known as Harbor East. Two good things happening in Baltimore right now. Harbor East, for sure, attracting tenants and providing uh, a beacon for that particular city of new development and uh, really nice space. And of course, the Baltimore Orioles, who not only have had a great baseball season, but when you watch them play, they play a great brand of baseball. They're always taking that extra base. They're always stealing bases, always hitting the cutoff man, uh, have really had a great season. So good for you, O's fans. Lester A. on LinkedIn wants a regular update on the European CRE and CMBS markets. We actually release a European market update blog every week that looks at the macro news and any CRE, CMBS, and CLO developments there. So check that out, and we'll talk about anything that's newsworthy on the podcast as well. Spinoso Real Estate will give you guys another shout-out because you gave us a pretty big shout-out for your shout-out on our podcast. So some matrix happening here and on twitter we had a bunch of engagement this week brian s this was me lurking but i saw you say that imagine getting called out on the trep podcast for having your loan go on the watch list well i have to say that we do deliver bad news sometimes and sometimes the bad news comes from watch list but lonnie and i and we are so on your side you know we want to see success we want to see tenant re tenant rebuilds we want to see uh, higher margins. We want to see costs come down and we hate being the deliverer of bad news. We, we really rooting for those guys that have put their own family savings to work, have invested in properties, put in not only their own money, but their own sweat equity. It takes a real leap of faith to be a, a commercial real estate developer. And we, we only have good thoughts for you. And CRE Debt Guy on Twitter said he was a big fan. JJ Real Estate also gave us a shout out and said, big trip fan. And then we actually have a special guest podcast coming up with Strip Mall Guy on Twitter. His handle is at Real Estate Trent. I'm sure a lot of you know of him. So we asked a bunch of you guys for questions ahead of that podcast. I think it'll be a great show and that'll be live next week. So stay tuned and reach out to us if you think there's something you want us to talk about. It's funny because my grandkids call me G-Man. That's the nickname uh, I go by is sort of like Pops or Grandpa. And so that's how everybody refers to me at the family outings, G-Man, which is great because I'm a Giants fan, as everybody knows, and that's what fans call the Giants. I want to know what Strip Mall Guy's wife calls him now, now that he's become such a big phenomenon on Twitter. You know, is it SMG? Is it Mall Guy? Is it, or is it still just, you know, what she knew him as when they first met and fell in love years ago? I don't, I'm, I'm dying to get that question. That's mine, Lonnie. You could put that on the the itinerary. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that one added to the list. I was wondering if he's got like a strip mall guy icon, you know, like the the, the image tattooed somewhere. You know, it's become so famous. <laughs> it's like that's his brand. Is it on the is it on the briefcase? Is it is there a tattoo? Is there a keychain? Like is is there merchandise available for the uh, the strip mall guy? Well, if so, we can ask him to add it to our collection with Lonnie on the ledge and what was it, Manus on the mantle? So with that, we'll close. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or a comment, send an email to podcast at trip.com and subscribe to the Tripwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right.